Good evening. Welcome to part five of the Ashtavakra teachings, Ashtavakra Gita teachings. Um, again, this evening I'm just going to amalgamate three, three of the lessons because again they're quite short. So we're going to talk about lesson six, which is the higher knowledge. Lesson seven, which is the nature of self-realization. Lesson eight, which is titled Bondage and Liberation. So, um, yeah, so before before I start reading those, uh, um, I was contemplating today, you know, we're, we're, we're quite, must be what, two, three weeks? I don't know, time seems to be... Uh, melting into just day-to-day -day moments of, um, I guess, uh, a complete and utter annihilation <laughs> of the usual routine that I guess all of us are um, used to or have experienced for quite a long time. Um, and I guess that brings with it challenges, but also it brings opportunity like everything does you know there's always two sides to a coin um but i was i was considering and i suppose i i was kind of thinking about it today a little bit as i was digging the vegetable patches in my garden and i shall tell you a bit more about that later uh, how conditioned we are i mean if you studied kabbalah if you studied any kind of let's call it esoteric tradition at some level, even even certain aspects of shamanism and shamanic cosmology. They talk about layers or rel different realms of, of being or different realms of experience where there are beings, conscious beings that exist in, in each of these realms. And the higher up the realms you go, the more liberated these beings are the 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 less their consciousness is conditioned and trapped the less their energy is confined the freer they are really um and yet you have realms which are much more conditioned and subject to many many more laws if you want to call them that and yeah we are we're really you know we're kind of we're experiencing at some level a state of um what the some kabbalists or gnostics call clip off okay <laughs> so clip off is hell yeah it's it's the arse end of the universe so the so as and as and when um any process decides to uh, eliminate its waste it takes it down through a very kind of dark <laughs> um <laughs> And confining process, you know, even in the human body, the digestive tract and, and the colon is, isn't particularly pleasant. Um, and the waste is eliminated, only to be recycled again into, you know, other levels of creation. So as more laws are enacted upon society, civil civilization, ourselves we tend to feel more and more confined. I mean, you can't sneeze or fart without, you know, someone giving you a fine or a ticket. <laughs> yeah. It just gets a little bit, oh my goodness, you know, how, how crazy is this really going to get? But, um, but there's some strong and deep lessons in there about, about confinement, about being boundaried in, in, in a certain way and being forced at some level to, um, slow down really slow down stop contemplate go inward uh i keep using that terminology go inward a lot of people say oh, what do you mean by going inward going inward for me can mean lots of different things for different people really but for me it means about becoming really aware of what's going on inside my body really aware of what is going on in my three centers. You can call them three brains if you want. The intellectual brain or mind, the heart brain or mind, 
and the motor sexual brain or mind. Okay, three centers, one, two, three. And each of these three centers um, at some level governs different aspects of our being. Yeah. And depending on how balanced these three centers are, we either live a balanced and harmonious existence within ourselves. Therefore, our perspective is more balanced. So every sense impression that we receive from the outer reality gets transformed through these three brains into uh, a perceptual framework, which we interpret subjectively. So our subjective um, relationship with the objective universe, if you want to call it that, um, is governed by these three centers. And these three centers can either be very balanced or they can be out of balance. And the more conditioned we are through beliefs, attachments, environmental conditioning, um, upbringing, ancestral karma, goodness knows what other crazy conditioning we, we undergo as a, as a, as a thinking humanoid on this, on this planet. Um, the more these three brains can't see clearly, or rather the more conditioned we are, the more filters we have in front of us to allow, or rather that the block the clarity, the objective clarity of, of what we interpret, really, what our senses interpret and how they interpret and how our perceptual framework imprints our reality. You know, it's quite deep to, to really think about it. But when you're in a state of semi-confinement, let's call it open prison, right? Um, you, you really start to understand where and how you've been conditioned because where you say you've been attached to going to work every day in a certain career and you don't do that anymore or where you've done certain things in a certain way or where you've spent certain amounts of time with certain people and now you're forced to spend time with other people, you you really start to get rattled a little bit. You start to... You, the, the, the conditioning that you've, you've been programmed with starts to get, I suppose, uh, at some level dismantled and this dismantling process is is actually quite good because it shows us where we've imprisoned ourselves at some level and, and at multiple levels um, within our three centers so where the the intellectual center um, overthinks situations where the heart centre over emotes situations and where the motor sexual centre um, over activates our physical movements um, or under activates them depending on the situations we're in, they can show us a little bit where we're out of balance um, but also where we've been conditioned a certain way. So when when we're taken out of that conditioned framework, what are we? Everything that you're used to, that you've identified with, that your three brains have been used to engaging with in a certain way, is now flipped. So what do you become when you're challenged like that? How does that, how does that centre feel, right? Does it get over-emotional? You know, are the emotions so strong that you can't control them? Okay. Are you, is there so much consciousness trapped in a certain condition to keep that center stable, right? That when that condition is altered or taken away or changed, yeah? How much of your energy are you giving to that emotional world? Okay. How much of you over, how much of your overthinking is draining your energy? Okay? Lots of conspiracy theories out there at the moment. Yeah? Not saying some of them are, might not be true or might be true. I don't know. Who knows, eh? Um, but if you're overthinking everything, if you're digging too deep into these rabbit holes, 
again, you know, whether these things are true or not, you're, you're starting to condition your consciousness into these tunnels, <laughs> which can take you a very, very long way down and steal a lot of your power, steal a lot of your energy. When you're not moving enough or where, whether or if you're moving too much or if you've been used to moving all the time, going to the gym, doing exercise, playing sport, all this kind of stuff, you're a highly energetic person. Now you're, you're locked away in your home or you're locked at some level in your home garden and then your trip to Tesco's or wherever you go shopping. You can't go to the gym. You can't play rugby on a Sunday morning. You can't, you can't do what you normally do. You're, you're either running, walking or cycling. Yeah? If you haven't got a bike, you're running or walking. If you can't be asked to run, you're walking. Yeah, and if you don't enjoy walking, you sat on your sofa, and that can get frustrating because that motor sec that motor center, you know, where it used to maybe transform energy by all these activities, needs to figure out a different way of transforming the energy now. So yeah, it's it's a it's a difficult situation, and 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 how we're conditioned, obviously affects the perception we have on our surroundings and of of the people that surround us. So let's be aware, you know, self-knowledge is about becoming aware of our own conditioning, our own shadow nature, our own wounds that get triggered during states of confinement and states of challenge. Uh, and it's, yeah, it can be a pretty tough gig at times. Sometimes it, it you know, it's, it's an absolute blessing. You know, I'm, I am personally, this is, this is heaven for me. <laughs> But I'm generally quite happy in my own company, you know. I'm not... Uh, I used to be quite an extrovert in my younger years, but uh, as life has kicked me in the ass too many times, I, I, f I feel very comfortable in my own skin now and uh, relish every opportunity I get to just to be with myself. And that's great. Um... So today I was digging my garden because uh, obviously the apocalypse is coming. Life as we know it won't won't be the same anymore. So we've all got to grow vegetables now, okay, and start to feed ourselves from our gardens. But on a more serious note, or on a more light-hearted note, um, I guess it is an opportunity to start looking at how you might be able to look after yourself a little bit more. You know, how conditioned are we? Or reliant and identified are we with these systems that ultimately are so fragile? You know, Tesco's, Sainsbury's, Asda's, Marks and Spencer's, you know, wherever you go and do your shopping, wherever you go and do your hunting and gathering, <laughs> right? If those things stop, if those things can't provide what you need anymore for whatever reason, what are you going to do then? Yeah? What are you going to do then? Do you know how to dig a garden? Do you know how to grow vegetables? Do you know how to at least provide some staples for yourself and your family? Most people probably not, to be honest with you. So, again, this is an opportunity to, to look at where you are so dependent and reliant on an intrinsic network and system which has been proven over the last few weeks to be so fragile at some level that a more drastic challenge to our existential paradigm could have an even deeper rippling effect on, on, on us as human beings going forward. So it's really time now to wake up. Wake up to where you have become dependent and reliant. Wake up to... How you can maybe, I don't know, set a goal for yourself to maybe grow enough food from your garden to feed you and your family for maybe two or three days a month. It's a starting point, isn't it? Um, or look at where you've been so conditioned and used to this hamster wheel of mindlessness rather than mindfulness that now that you've got some time to sit and be still, that you utilise that time to actually start to undergo some transformation and look at looking on yourself. Look look at how look at how still you are not 
when you're forced to be still, look at how agitated you might be, how irritated you might be, how you're always constantly distracting yourself. And try to withdraw and try to release and liberate aspects of your consciousness that are trapped in these temptations and addictions and distractions. Because to be comfortable and fulfilled and content within yourself, no matter what's going on around you, no matter how the world might be playing out right now, is an absolute gift. It's a blessing. And it's something that I would encourage everyone to start to work on. Because, you know, as a famous bloke 2,000 years ago said, you don't know the day when all this is going to end. And what state of being, what state of mind are you going to be in? How balanced are your three centers going to be? Right? When maybe you're facing death. Are you going to be walking into death with a peaceful heart and a still mind and a, and a state of non-agitation? Or are you going to be walking into it potentially with regret, with worry, with anxiety, with fear. Because no matter what your belief system, no matter whether whether you engage in any of this kind of spiritual stuff or not, really, um, there has to be at some level a state of serenity within you, no matter what is going on around you. If you get too pulled into the currents of Maya, <laughs> into this fairground, into Pinocchio's fairground, when the ice cream, the candy floss gets taken away, when the roller coasters get shut down, right, and, and when things start to rot away and fall apart, what's your inner realm going to be like? Because that's the only thing you've got. Truly. So, lesson six. The higher knowledge. I am infinite space. The universe is a jar. This I know. No need to renounce, accept or destroy. I am a shoreless ocean. The universe makes waves. This I know. No need to renounce, accept or destroy. I am mother of pearl. The universe is the illusion of silver. This I know. No need to renounce, accept or destroy. I am in all beings. All beings are in me. This I know. No need to renounce, accept or destroy. Lesson number seven. The nature of self-realisation. And Janaka said, In me, the shoreless ocean, the arc of universe drifts here and there on the winds of its nature. I am not impatient. In me, the shoreless ocean, let the waves of the universe rise and fall as they will. I am neither enhanced nor diminished. In me, the shoreless ocean, the universe is imagined. I am still and formless. In this alone I abide. The self is not in objects, nor are objects in the pure and infinite self. The self is tranquil, free of attachment and desire. In this alone I abide. I am awareness alone. The world is a passing show. How can thoughts arise of acceptance or rejection? And where? Lesson number eight, bondage and liberation. Ashtavakra said, when the mind desires or grieves, 
accepts or rejects, is pleased or displeased, this is bondage. When the mind does not desire or grieve, accept or reject, become pleased or displeased, liberation is at hand. If the mind is attached to any experience, this is bondage. When the mind is detached from all experience, this is liberation. When there is no I, there is only liberation. When I appears, bondage appears with it. Knowing this, it is effortless to refrain from accepting and rejecting. And that's lesson eight, bondage and liberation, which is kind of pertinent to what I was talking about before those three lessons. And the more attached we are to our conditioning and the more attached we are to this paradigm, the more we suffer, the more we suffer when things change. So utilize this gift, this gift, yes, yeah, kind of a gift to start to unpick some of these and, and learn to learn to adapt, learn to become adaptable. See you next time.